I never got a chance to hear whether you were happy or unhappy with brokering that uh, interaction with Destiny. Uh, I was very happy with it. Uh, I'll be honest. I, I'm, well, I was going to ask you about what kind of uh, backlash you got in terms of uh, from from your circles, but I had a a very large portion of uh, the online left. Uh, they were furious for for even organizing that, uh, <laughs> saying saying uh, this this was beneath uh, Richard and and all this kind of stuff. Uh, and the idea that someone who has a real name would rename himself Destiny struck me as somewhere between three and three and a half years of age in terms of maturity. But in any case... But you're, you're talking to a guy we, called the Serfs. <laughs> so. yeah, yeah. Good one. Well, you know, the Serfs Good one. Has, some, has some... You know, I like that because that's what we are in many ways. And, and I... There is a substance... Destiny? The Serfs talking about you. Oh, cool. All right. Ask him if you watched Cowboy Bebop. I could talk to him about Cowboy Bebop. I'm sure. I could ask him, is, is Cowboy Bebop going to be in the socialist future as well? Uh, thoughts on the DDG long text memes? Well, I, I was gonna... you have to, uh, you're going to have to go talk to your workers' council and hope that they want to uh, make that anime for you. <laughs> Man, this this start of the show is going to get clipped and shipped. People already think like I'm an absolute clown for having thrown that debate uh, uh, in different leftist circles. Oh, but that's my point. That's my point about... Um, the Twitter and when you get to a certain point like I have now I'm so th so that's like one of my key my key indicators for success whenever people are really mad that something happened it usually means that like they are unhappy with the performance of the person that they say like dominated because you have to imagine like let's say that we go on and um, let's say that like I don't know anything like I don't know what the stock market is I don't know what socialism blah blah blah, blah and Richard Wolf just completely on me right nobody is saying like you shouldn't have had that debate it was irresponsible that debate was horrible they'd always sound like oh finally we can have somebody showcase like how clueless this guy is like oh my god like epic ownage like did you see richard wolf totally destroy and eviscerate that dumb blah 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 but when people are saying things like you shouldn't have done that that was irresponsible it's not a good format then you know they're upset because they didn't feel like their their side performed that well yeah and then all of a sudden, people who I thought used to like me uh, were quote tweeting me like, "This was disgusting. The surfs did this. Disgusting. They would do this for the points, for the, for the Twitter like social media score." Hello, Richard. Can you hear me? Hello, I can hear you fine. Can you see me this time? I can see you. You've got a blue shirt. I, I do. It says, got, uh, it says abolish ice. It's, it's now, would we call that blue or would we uh, say, well, it's not red, blue. it's not green? Okay, I'm done. I'm sorry. Good. And I can see a plant behind you and a, a doll and uh, <laughs> a mirror door and all kinds of stuff. Uh, there's there's a number of plants, yes. Uh, how, is, how is life? How, how are you doing? Fine. I never got a chance to hear whether you were happy or unhappy with brokering that uh, interaction with Destiny. Uh, I was very happy with it. Uh, I'll be honest. I, I'm, well, I was going to ask you about what kind of uh, backlash you got in terms of uh, from, from your circles. But I had a, a very large portion of uh, the online left. Uh, they were furious for, for even organizing that. Uh, saying saying uh, this this was beneath uh, Richard and, and all this kind of stuff uh, and I was like well okay I'll, I'll give you my personal opinion that that reached uh, close to I think 40,000 people watched that live between all of the different streams we had and I, I think that was a golden opportunity to expose a lot of people to some of these ideas but um, you know I'd love to hear your opinion on it um well the good news uh, I agree with you that's why we did it I mean you know I didn't, to be honest with you, I hope I don't reveal anything terribly. I didn't know who Destiny was. And the idea that someone who has a real name would rename himself Destiny struck me as somewhere between three and three and a half years of age in terms of maturity. But in any case... But you're, you're talking to a guy who, called the Serfs. <laughs> so. yeah, yeah. Good one. Well, you know, the Serfs Good one. Has, some, has some, you know, I like that because that's what we are in many ways. And, and I... There is a substance destiny anyway. Um, so <laughs> get me on here again. If we want to go hard. We conclude. We talked about it, and we conclude. You know, we were appreciative of your your taking the initiative to think about doing it and all that. No more kids gloves, guys. But you know, I have an enormous schedule. I I, I don't know about you guys, but I I could be doing this, what I'm about to do with you, 
I could be doing it all day, every day, seven days a week. I mean, look, part of me is grateful. I never expected in my life to have the opportunity that I now have. So I, I please understand me. Part of me is thrilled that, that there's an audience for the leftist stuff I do on a scale like that. So I'm, I'm grateful. I really am, you know. Uh, on the other hand, it's friggin' overwhelming. You know, it, it it intrudes. You know, you you have to schedule going to the bathroom. You know, it's, it's kind of <laughs> weird. That's um, its name. Anyway, so we what we tend to do is we have to we have to come up with reasons not to do it mm -hmm. because there's so many opportunities to do it. So we, you know, like many groups, we we also take a look, among other things, at the size of the audience. And it was clear to us that this would be, A, a sizable audience, and B, an audience we don't have that many opportunities, probably, to talk to or to reach. And that, and, and I, I'm happy that it happened because of all of that. Well, we, got also a lot of feed, we got a lot of feedback, um, and a good bit of it was consistent with what you just said. Um, and some of it wasn't very nice, like... Why are you doing this? Uh, what a waste of your time. Uh, you're making this crap that they do somehow more legitimate. You shouldn't mm -hmm. be doing, I mean, all of that. Um, but we got a good bit of people saying that, that, you know, it went well and that a lot of these arguments were heard by people who don't hear them very often. And, and that it was useful that way, and you know. Well, so, I, mean, I wanted the end to say too. Was we we think we got what we hoped to get. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I wanted to say oh, too, I though. There's say. well, I wanted to say there's there was this weird condescension that I found too of people being like, "This is this is beneath you because it's not academic." Because he's somehow speaking to someone who doesn't have like a, a tenureship or something or, or of that nature. <laughs> but I well, I just found that really condescending because I was like, "That seems out of touch to me." Uh, you know, there's there's like there's thousands of people who watch and look up to Destiny uh, who could be exposed to like some of these uh, principles or theories. Like, I don't think uh, the idea behind uh, you know understanding socialism should be relegated to uh, academia exclusively. That seems ridiculous. Uh, absolutely. No, and, and on the contrary, if they're limited to academia, they're never going to get to the kind of social change that they ostensibly favor. I mean, absolutely. But you know, I've spent my whole life in American academia. It is a, a realm that engages in this kind of prestige mongering around academic uh, credentials. Oh. My That's horrific. God. I, mean, I don't mind Pat, telling you. I got a job because in a I went station, to I the fanciest schools next to. to. By the way, I'm where did you someone. hear about Star Sector, Stephen? That game has been my cocaine for Countless the past few Countless times in my life where my politics got me in trouble. Glory to Pepe. I got out of the trouble by waving my pedigree in people's faces, and they backed off. Like mm -hmm. the devil, you know, when you wave the garlic, he, he takes off. Because it's scary, or there's something about devils that doesn't go with garlic. Do you, you uh, mean vampires? Yeah, something like that, you know. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, you tell people you went to Harvard and Yale, and they, they think, you know, somehow uh, something special happened there, uh, which I... And by the way, you might enjoy this. I have an easier time persuading people about the virtues of socialism than I have explaining to people that the Harvard-Yale business is fake. They mm. don't want to hear that. I'm talking left-of-center audiences. When you say fake, what do you mean? It's... Here's a metaphor I would use. If you turn on the TV and there's an advertisement for soap, mm -hmm. a bar of soap, and the advertisement says, use this bar of soap and your sex life will really get much better. You giggle because you understand that it's soap and that they're trying to sell the soap. So the soap is going to do, they're going to make claims. You're not going to take it seriously. You're going to find it vaguely amusing. End of it. Harvard and Yale 
give you an education. They teach you courses. That's about it. The rest of it is fake. It's just, you should giggle. It just giggle. Oh, you mean the pedigree? Like like what? Uh, like the cert- certification? You, or? Yeah. It, it, the only thing, the quality of education is, and I mean this, so I'm, I'm not being playing with you. It's mediocre. Mm-hmm. It's not the worst, but it's not the best. Mm-hmm. You'd be if if what you want is a really good education in which people who've done a lot of thinking and reading and writing sit down with you and help you work through study, then you're much better off to go to a small four year liberal arts college stuck away in the woods of Vermont or some other place where you can knuckle down. And, and and really do that and do it with a supportive group of people who give a crap about teaching. Mm-hmm. But if, if that's what you want, don't go to Harvard. And I had no idea what I was getting into. So it, for people like me and I'm the norm, it probably didn't make all that much difference. We had no idea what we wanted. If you had asked me, what do you want out of college? I wouldn't have known what to say anyway. It was something I did because everybody like me did that. And my parents had been given the idea that's what their kids should do. So I did it. Uh, but here is the difference. You meet the right people because they're working their ass off to get the the, the rich, the well-connected, the, the elites. They want their kids at Harvard and Yale. So they, they turn the world upside down to get that done. Mm-hmm. And so you're going to meet those people. If that's of interest to you, fine. If it isn't, nothing. Mm-hmm. And the, the last thing you get is you get a pedigree over and over again. Look, let me be blunt. My guess is if I didn't go to those schools, as a European, I have no idea about this. Is Ivy League school overrated in terms of quality of education? Um, because depends my on what trajectory you're going for. would not have ended me up in this situation. Like if you're so, going you to know, law at, school, at it's incredibly important. People just think something. Like medical school, super maybe not as much. Happens when you go to these places, it doesn't. Well, you could have ended up as a soap salesman. Yes, I could have. <laughs> by the way, in that university... Undergrads at Ivy Harvard, Leagues, I don't know if that matters at all. For a great deal. But listen, in my PhD in my Yale class, my classmate was Janet Yellen. So I know Janet Yellen, and Janet Yellen knows me. That's but I mean, the connections and everything you get are also you always good, no matter you what that. you end up... Connections. You know, and, that, and that may mean nothing. On the other hand... If I pick up the phone and I call and I say who I am and I'd like to speak to Janet Yellen, she might actually pick up the phone, not because of who I am and what I'm saying, but because she has a memory. Mm-hmm. And, you know, she remember, oh, yeah, that guy, you know, that, kind of, that and, you know, and people make careers out of that crap. You know? Yeah. <laughs> so. I wanted to ask you. Um, would you be comfortable, because I'm obviously not going to uh, do like a drama stream or anything, but going through some of the arguments and some of the um, problems that both people on the left and the center and the right brought up from that debate uh, for, for, for clarification? Uh, yeah, if you, if you think, I mean, this is your program and your audience. Uh, I'm at your disposal. If you think that would be of interest and engage me, absolutely. Well, I mean, reading Fine. from reading from the audience right now, they're they're mostly interested in soap and where they can find it. But I'm I'm yes. gonna I'm gonna supersede them. All right, uh, I'll 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 right. just I'll ask about the debate. So one of um one of the questions that people on uh, the left were upset about is they said that Richard Wolff basically doesn't speak about abolishing markets. That his form which is probably defined more as market socialism than it is actual socialism, uh, is concerned, obviously, with worker ownership, co-ownership of, of the means of production. However, he doesn't go as far as, say, something that Marx would do in like uh, than Greece or, or in some of his other writing, where he specifically lays out that the commodity production also has to meet demand, right? And so in, in your version, you've got uh, the market still existing and them still influencing people and, and to purchase, ultimately. So what would you say to that? Uh, there's a number of ways of responding to that. I'm going to be a little blunt in order to get to kind of the meat <laughs> of the issue. Oh, boy. Uh, and so I'll overstate slightly, but it, it'll make the point. 
we don't need Marx for a critique of markets. The critique of markets is way older than Marx and lots of other people. Uh, for me, for example, reading the fictional works of Balzac in French, you get a fantastic critique of markets. The whole transition from feudalism to capitalism, which was marked by the extent <laughs> of the market into oh, all man. aspects of our lives. It's like a greatest hits meme. A vast outpouring of people horrified by this quid pro quo exchange, by this way of getting goods from the producer to the consumer by a, a, a bargaining in a market. I'll give you three of my oranges if you give me two of your shirts. That there had to be better ways, people thought, ways from feudalism and even earlier systems. Because this kind of quid pro quo is a denial of all of the other things that ought to shape the distribution of goods and services. It shouldn't be that I get three oranges because I give you four shirts. You ought to be able to get three oranges for thousands of reasons, because you're hungry, because your children are hungry, because you've been eating too much of other stuff and you need some fruits. Or, you know, a million considerations that ought to play a role rather than saying, you get the oranges if you got enough shirts, Jack. So for me, I don't want or need Marx to give me a critique of markets. Let me put it another way. When I teach courses in the history of economic thought, I usually start with Plato and Aristotle. Why? Because even though there was no such thing as economics, so defined back then, uh, these were very smart men who thought about society and who understood that a part of society is the production and distribution of goods and services. So when they thought about society, they thought about what we now call the economy, even though for them it was handled with other conceptual frameworks. One of the things Plato and Aristotle discussed were markets because the slave society of ancient Sparta, of ancient Greece, where they did their, where they lived and where they thought, was experiencing the arrival of markets. Markets for slaves, buying and selling slaves, and markets for the produce that slave labor generated. So they discussed it. And by the way, both Plato and Aristotle didn't like markets. Plato wanted to abolish them. Aristotle disagreed. He said they're not good, but it would be so disruptive of society now to get rid of markets that we have to find a midpoint. And what he proposed was a rigidly socially controlled market. That way you wouldn't have to undo the system, but you could reduce its negative consequences, which he enumerated, and, and build up its positive ones. So for 5,000 years since then, people have made all kinds of critical comments on markets. No one needs me for that. And we don't need Marx for it either. And Marx was very clear in my reading, and I understand different people read the same text and come away with different interpretations. But in my reading, Marx begins with commodities and markets in volume one of Capital, but within a very few pages, he takes us to the other place in the economy in which he was much more interested, namely production. What happens before or after the market? After in the sense that you buy the inputs the tools, equipment, the raw material, and you buy the labor power, you hire workers, and then you put them to work, and then you have an output, and then the market shows up again because you sell the output. But Marx was not primarily interested in the buying or the selling. He was interested in the what he called the relations of production. Hint, that's where he was was interested. And the reason, he explains, 
is that it's in production that something crucial happens, namely that part of the people involved in production, in capitalism we call them employees, produce more than they get in the wage paid to them for coming to work. And in the difference between the value added by the worker's labor and the value of the wage paid to the worker, in that difference, which Marx called the extra, the more that the worker produces than he gets, that's the surplus. The English translation of the German word mehr or more is surplus. Very bad translation, but we live with it. That surplus, that's Marx's point. There it is, folks. There's where profit, surplus, growth, it all happens right there in production. I'm going to show it to you, and then I'm going to explain how that surplus is taken by a tiny minority in every capitalist enterprise, the owners, the employer, the board of directors in the corporation, and distributed by them socially. I'm going to show you all of that. That's the crucial exposure that a critique of capitalism has to understand. And that's what the people before me, Marx writes, didn't get. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I focus on production. <laughs> Last point. I mean, again, I'm going to exaggerate, but to drive the point home. Yeah, of I don't care. I don't care whether the distribution of goods and services is handled by a market or by a planning apparatus. Yeah, welcome to liberalism then. Combination of them. That's a secondary concern. If you ask my personal opinion, I don't like markets. I was persuaded before I ever encountered Marx uh, that the market is a crude, ugly, and unfair way. And, and the argument is very simple. In a market, whenever something is scarce, that is, whenever the demand exceeds the supply, the price goes up. And that's a rationing system. It means that the scarcity is overcome because the rising price prices the people who don't have much money out. They can't offer to buy it anymore because they can't pay that price. Price is a rationing mechanism. And for me, the notion that something that is scarce is going to finally be allocated to those with the most money is morally and ethically unacceptable. Why? What about yachts? There are millions yachts better are scarce. reasons like, for uh, distributing whatever is scarce is than the fact that the final recipient of a scarce good is the one with the most money in his or her pocket. I, I find that so obvious that it doesn't interest me very much. So... I can live, if we do some things with market exchange, I can live with it. If we do some things with planning, I'm happier than I am with markets. But for me, that's a much secondary question than the issue, are we going to organize the production? That place where people go five days a week, nine to five, go to work in the factory, the office, the store. What are the human relationships in that situation. How do they organize the production, appropriation, and distribution of the surplus? That's what has to be changed fundamentally. Last point. We've had markets with slavery. We've had markets with feudalism. <laughs> we've had markets with capitalism. It is definitional nonsense to refer to capitalism as a market system. The way, by the way, the New York Times does literally every day. It is not a market system. In other words, that's not a definitional boundary that separates it from feudalism or slavery or other systems too that used markets. What's distinctive about capitalism is the relationship of production. The relationship in slavery between master and slave Destiny didn't like this because it was history. 
<laughs> he didn't want history. But the, the God, what a loser! Oh, this guy is so stupid. Relationship in production. The distinctive thing. Capital about has them. nothing to do with markets. How the, what do you? How, what does free enterprise look like with no market transfer? Like, I, how does it even make sense? Please, professor, can you please explain? Employer employee contractual relationship that that system has, which demarcates it from the slavery and the feudalism that preceded it. For all those reasons, I don't focus on markets. Yeah, um, but this would be my point because you said you, if we wanted to say take a modern uh, stance on this, you can separate the Marxian analysis from it, which uh, I'm, I would be completely fine with. But the idea that perhaps I don't even know if he knows what a market is. Also, I have no the idea. Framework but. and system it, existing, right? Like I don't think. Uh, and you can correct me on this, if you change the paradigm alone into a world in which we had a majority uh, worker cooperatives, that would fix the same problems that are inherent into the capitalist system. Like if I would define capitalism as being able to own and sell capital, right, capital goods, whatever you want to define that as, within that system itself, we have a majority of worker what? cooperatives, uh, which okay. I think is a much better uh, a much better framework. I, I think it's much more egalitarian, uh, all of that perspective. But there's still the aspect of people who have more capital to begin with will have more power in society, correct? Especially when it comes to the influence in, say, politics. That was something else that was was kind of crucial in, in the Marxian analysis of this. So that doesn't eliminate those problems. It kind of operates within a capitalist framework. Uh-oh. Well, it depends on what you mean by markets. I mean, every market that I've ever studied or ever worked in uh, is contextualized depends how a market works depends on the, Dude, the he rules can't the answer. regulations he can't answer anything he actually which, can't have a conversation uh, the, the market works if you don't want inequality for example you don't want some people to have a lot of money that they can use in political influence compared to others there's all kinds of ways you can constrict and constrain markets, which have been done historically precisely to prevent that sort of I thing just gotta get a uh, while from happening. I can't I mean, resist. We don't allow the wage to be determined by the market in the United States. We have a law which says there's a minimum wage. That's if like that applies to like three percent of earners. The market does settle on most wages by far. Jail. Okay, we're not allowing the market to function you are you're going to be taxed we're taking money away from you that's it. i don't know if End he actually knows what markets are i legitimately don't know to jail you go we are constraining what the market can do if if you're concerned about inequality if you're concerned about a whole host of social issues then there are all these steps you can take it's still a market system but it's a market system that is not allowed to function in these ways and those ways then there are whole uh, distributions in a market economy so called that are not in the market i mean let me give you an example uh, when you go home to dinner tonight and you sit down with your, with your friends or your, your family, uh, there's a division of labor. Some of you cook the dinner. Some of you set the table. Some of you take out the garbage. Some of you vacuum the rug. Okay, how, get, how does that get worked out? Well, you could have a market system. You could get three drumsticks of a chicken for 27 square yards of carpet that you uh, vacuum. No, no, I'm serious. Yeah, you yeah, could yeah. arrange. You could arrange to distribute what each of you do to make the household livable. That would be a market. But I use it because everybody giggles when I say it. Why? Only because in our culture we exclude that kind of arrangement. We arrange the distribution of tasks and the enjoyment of the fruit of those tasks non-marketedly. We don't allow the market to function. If you took out the garbage, and when you were done, you came in from the outside because you had deposited the bags of garbage into the cans outside, and you turned to the rest of the people in the room and say, I'd like $2 from each of you because I just took out the garbage, people would either throw something at you or laugh at you because it's preposterous but of course it isn't. It's just that in our culture, the market is excluded from the inside of the house by the same people who celebrate it outside the house because they argue, and you'll love this, 
Outside the house, it's efficient, you see. Inside the house, it violates the norms of a loving relationship among members of a family. Your mother or father would scold you for demanding money to take out the garbage, and they would give you a lecture that says, hey, this is a family. We take care of each other. We care about it. Of course, we like to do things for each other, and on that basis, we have a family. So, Go a- figure, huh? You need a mark? You- so you're telling me that between you and three people in your house, you can figure out like what chores and everything to do? And you can't do that for the entire rest of the fucking world? Come on, dude. Come on. Do you really have to give your friend 27 drumsticks in order to convince him to take the trash out? Oh, well, if you guys don't need a barter system inside your house between four people, then why would you need some sort of more complicated, bougie market system to coordinate billions of transactions a day? Can't you all just come to the same types of agreements that your mom and dad do? Like... It's crazy that we use different things in different areas, huh? Weird, huh? Other crisis then, the, the one being of the unjustified hierarchy that the markets will impose upon people. Cause, well, cause... I think you would, you would have to look at every way that the market produces, let's say, uh, inequality of a certain sort. Uh, but I'll give you an example. The Mondragon Corporation in Spain <laughs> has a law, a rule, uh, that governs the 100,000 plus uh, people that are part of that corporation. Uh, And that is that the best paid person cannot get more than about eight or nine times what the lowest paid person gets. That's a rule, don't have to do it, but that's a rule. So that every every payment of a wage, which is a market transaction, the the co-op as a whole buys the labor power of each of the members of that co-op. They have constricted that exchange so it cannot go outside of a certain range because in their view that renders an acceptable degree to be clear again mondragon is a confederation of co-ops and what he's talking about only applies within a particular co-op within the whole of mondragon there are going to be people that out earn dramatically people at the top between people on the bottom that ratio does not apply to the entire federation get the benefit of markets and there are some decentralized decision making and other things that are attractive. You can try to get those positives while constricting or re- removing the negatives. And, and you manage your institution that way. Footnote, that's how all human institutions are, are managed. There are pluses and minuses to having a government. There are pluses and minuses to having a marriage. There are pluses and minuses, you know, you pick your institution and what society is, is the attempt to get from these institutions what is deemed positive and to control or limit the institution around the things that are deemed negative. Yeah, of course. Uh, but I would then <laughs> say, in your example of like the family, there is still yeah. uh, some sure. un, like there's some justified hierarchies that we we would impose that I think are necessary, right? Like you, your kids will have to uh, be obedient to you in a certain respect. Um, uh, you know, with, within Wolf's a framework, about to lose it. He's and, and that upset. would be necessary to a healthy family dynamic. So, are, are you saying that you can extrapolate that, like that metaphor, further into society itself? Yes, because I would tell you right away, and you know this too, that the obedience of the child is immediately uh, matched up with constraints on the parents, lest they use the rule of obedient child to abuse the child. And then a whole set of rules and regulations have been struggled over for eons to limit, to constrict, and to control can you beat your child? There are societies right now that forbid corporal punishment. A parent, wow. yeah, you, you you get obedience, but you cannot strike the child. If you do, we will arrest you, and we will take that child away from you, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So obedience has its limits. Obedience has to be offset by constrictions and controls. Uh, obedience has to run both ways. There have to be ways in which the children can make their needs known to which their parents must be obedient, et cetera, et cetera. Can I catch so, fish yeah, without I a... Yeah, I think um, there's a perfect parallel. The market is an institution what like that. What do I that. need a bait for? And I find it strange 
uh, oh, to kind Can of buy in a bait? wholesale way either embrace the institution as if it had no contradictions within it or to dismiss an institution as if it had no. I mean, I am a student of Marx and he was a student of Hegel. Everything has got its pluses and minus. Everything has its strengths and weaknesses. And in a way, much of life is the endless negotiation of how to milk the institutions we invent as human beings to pull from them the positive and to extinguish or at least minimize the negative. And since institutions are always changing, this is an endless process. How does that system eliminate some of the bigger problems, say, like the military industrial complex, for example, something that is purely profit driven and that obviously has a lot of detrimental effects on society? Um, just the idea, I think, of having a, a multiple amount of worker cooperatives wouldn't address something like that, or, or perhaps the, the profit motive behind the pharmaceutical industry, for example, both in both cases. Um, how, how does one uh, propose solutions to that? Yeah, I think the, the, the issue here, if, if, if I could go slightly afield, I think the issue here is expecting from the class transformational change more than it can deliver. Mm. I mean, for me, I understand that the organization of the workplace with employer-employee, that the quintessentially capitalist production organization, is an obstacle to a whole lot of social values that are important for me. Uh -huh. And so I'm a critic or an opponent of capitalism because I want to achieve those objectives and capitalism as an organization of production stands in the way. But it has never occurred to me to think that by making the changes of the organization of production, all of the problems that I'm concerned about are going to be solved. I think that is an extremely dangerous expectation of any proposed change. You can't go from a specific objective you've worked out is an important thing to do and then say, well, but there'll be problems, even if you do it, there'll be these problems that it it's, will not be solved by what you've just proposed. I agree. We're not going to solve all the problems that we have in a modern capitalist society by changing the organization of production. Mm -hmm. But it's a major step that I focus on mostly because other people haven't. Other, In other words, when I interrogate Marx and I ask myself a very basic, simple question, why did Marx, in his mature work, focus so heavily on the relation between the employer and the employee in the, in the, in the workplace? I mean, why? I know he started somewhere else. He was, he was a student of philosophy. He studied ancient Greek philosophers. He wrote his doctoral. Day. What the hell happened to him? Why did he? For me, as a young kid trying to learn this stuff, I asked that question. And the answer I came up with you know, if a lifetime of reading and studying this stuff and teaching it, is that Marx focused on that not because it's any more important than anything else. He focused on it because other people who had tried to make society better, that he identified with those kinds of people, had missed this point, had not understood when they made all kinds of other changes, that in order to get the results they were hoping for, you have to also change the organization of production. They hadn't understood that, they hadn't attended to it, and that was the contribution Marx felt he could make, not instead of what they had done. So, you know, when people before Marx said, let's get rid of kings, monarchy is a crappy way to organize political life, Marx is absolutely he cheers them on, right on. But when they tried to set up a democratic society as against monarchy, for example, they didn't succeed. They failed. And Marx asks himself, well, I love the objective and I agree that the monarchy was standing in the way. What happened? 
Why didn't capitalism deliver on liberty, equality, fraternity, democracy, and all the other things they promised? And the answer is the organization of production was overlooked. And I'm going to analyze that, and I'm going to show people how that operates as an obstacle. But there are <laughs> a lot Lance. of problems <laughs> oh, that are no. still left in society that will have to be addressed. And I don't think it's fair, honestly, mm -hmm. to say, gee, this change doesn't solve all the problem. You're right. It doesn't. But the expectation that it ever would is what's bizarre. It sounds like uh, you're in intersectionless then, that you want to apply like an intersectional analysis to it as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. I Base just would liberal take. Hello. Yes. We have had, and let me do it right now in case anyone's wondering <laughs> where I'm coming from. Do we have a, a set of racial issues that are crucial in our society? You bet. Do we have a lot of gender issues? Uh, do we have a lot of sexual orientation? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. But I do notice with a certain sardonic cast uh -oh. of mind they only that care about those for can be discussed much more readily than the organization of production. True. That will the minute you get to that, some sets of taboos come into play. And that should be understood because until recently, many comparable taboos applied to the discussion of gender or applied to the discussion of race. So those things turned out, and nor am I surprised, to be a little less taboo written, ridden than this class issue, and that <laughs> makes me even more confident that I'm touching a relevant nerve when, a la Marx, we go in and say, wait a minute, that too has to be addressed. When you say that it's um, dangerous taboo. to try... The year is 2023. A black guy driving a nice red Ferrari tears off down the road. He's not speeding, though. He sees sirens his rearview mirror, he looks over to his white friend in the car and he goes, oh shit. And they both realize they're fucked. He pulls the car over, cop gets out of his car. He's already got his hand on his gun. Black guy puts his hands on the steering wheel and he tells his white friend, just don't say anything. I'll make sure we get out of this okay. Cop walks over, knocks a few times on the black guy's door. He's like, can you roll your window down? The black guy's like, <coughs> Listen, officer, I don't want any trouble. And the officer looks at the black kid right in the eye and he says, your white friend over there, is that a f socialist? Oh, shit, and it's all over, boys. Another poor socialist lost to police violence. One of the most taboo subjects in America, being a so one of the most dangerous, one of the most dangerous conditions to be afflicted with. It be through socialist labor unions or socialist political parties or socialist intellectuals or whatever. The Soviet Union, putting aside for a moment the Paris Commune, but the Soviet Union is the first, let's institute what it is we were trying to get at when we criticized capitalism. It takes socialism in a very new direction from being the sustained criticism of capitalism, which after all, uh, that's what Marx was. He didn't write about socialism. He wrote about capitalism. He devoted himself to understanding capitalism. The goal was to get beyond it, but he never believed in writing about the future. He, he, he called those people utopian socialists, and he, he, that wasn't meant as a flattery either. So uh -oh. he is about capitalism. And for me, it's crystal clear in my head that everything changes when socialists take power. And the Soviet <laughs> Union true. is the first Ask other big socialists. <laughs> experiment on a national basis for what the hell socialists in power might mean. China is the second major experiment. Cuba, Vietnam, North Korea are little experiments. Uh, and as uh, here I'm a historian. As there were experiments emerging from feudalism, and I know this bothered destiny too, the, the history. <laughs> but what else have we got? There were many efforts to set up. This guy's like an oblivion NPC. Oh my God. Capitalisms in Italian cities, in, in, in the low countries, in, in what we now call Belgium, Netherlands, and uh, Luxembourg. 
they failed. They, some of them lasted a few months. Some of them lasted a few years. They were what we could call now experiments in capitalism. And what they taught people were things that worked pretty well that we want to keep and things that went very badly wrong that we don't want to reproduce. And slowly over time, you kind of assembled enough of the conditions that you could have capitalism sustain. I think we're at the same position relative to socialism. There were things the Soviets figured out that we want to build on. And there were things the Soviets did, summarily called Stalinism, that we want to make sure to avoid. Ditto for the Chinese, ditto for the Cubans. And that's how the transitions go. And we shouldn't be all upset that the first experiments, Russia, China, have things we don't want. That's what we should have expected, not that we should be shocked or upset by this. We should have learned. Marxists have to make criticism of things done in the name of Marxism. Otherwise, it's not a serious intellectual or, or revolutionary tradition. And for me, I, I find it bizarre that anybody would want to go back and, you know, redo or do again Stalinism. I do like the idea that let's, let's be honest and ruthless. What was it that Stalin did that we think was awful, counterproductive, evil, and to be dropped uh -oh. and, and, and rendered demonic, oh, never mind, never mind. Uh, fine with me. And what were the things he did that we need to build on? That, that For me, that's a logical way uh, to go after it. And I know that's very difficult in the United States, but that's because we've had 75 years of Cold War ideology that made, you know, you know, that made it necessary for us to be told like I was in all my schooling in the United States, um, that we're good and they're bad. And I assume over in the Soviet Union, they did the reverse. I, mean, I don't know, but I assume it. Um, and we have to dig out from under that. Otherwise, we will not get the useful lessons um, from those early experiments that we need to make progress. By the way, yeah. the Soviet Union and China, just for the record, never never abandoned private property in the means of production mm -hmm. and never abandoned markets partly because they didn't want to and partly because I thought they the Soviet Union tried to do to. um and so Soviet for example, uh, if you allocation want to at one point at least didn't they, did they not between socialism as a movement on the one hand and private property markets and private enterprise you've got a you've got a real analytical task in front of you that is not accomplished by some breezy equation of socialism or communism as the absence uh, and the and the capitalism as the presence it'd be nice if things were neat and simple like that but they never are mm -hmm. i mean i think you just revealed you're not terminally online like myself i i, I don't know if that was a call out <laughs> <laughs> well, but the thing is, like, I don't I don't think of China as being like what they like to call themselves as, which is uh, socialism with Chinese characteristics. Right. I, 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 I think of them more as a state controlled corporation uh, that has a mixed market economy uh, and also does global exchange with, within the capitalist system itself. So I, I don't really look to them as being like the great uh, socialist experiment. Is, but is that is that something that you you think is wrong in in, in its interpretation? No. Okay. No, I mean I would I think we probably agree here, but I would say it a little differently. I get real nervous when we have a conversation. It is or it isn't socialist. And the reason I get nervous is because social that there's no bureau, there's no office, there's no authority that gives out cards indicating, well, you're a socialist now, you've passed the test, you've fulfilled the requirements. Socialism is a contested notion. We don't agree. Socialists never have is exactly what it is. There's always been contesting notions of what socialism is. And in the world today, there are basically, I would argue, three big ones. Number one, uh, the notion that socialism is Scandinavia, Western Europe, societies in which there is a government 
that uh, softens the otherwise hard edges or harsh edges of capitalism. Uh, in other words, it leaves enterprise in the hands of private uh, enterprises who hire workers in the usual way, but these people are constricted and constrained by a government that mandates minimum wages or maximum wages or both, uh, that controls interest rates, uh, that controls the money supply, uh, a, a whole raft of things that we can point. That's a kind of quote unquote socialism. socialism. Why? They call themselves socialists. They point <laughs> well, why to not the Nazis, Wolf? where they come out of the European Dick, you forget about socialist the Nazis. tradition that formed itself in the 19th century. Okay, I mean, I'm not going to give them a certificate. Yes, no. Here's the second kind. The second kind criticizes the first kind. You don't go far enough, the second kind says. When you control the private enterprises, you're deluding yourself. They can get out of your controls. They can evade them. They can eviscerate them. They can undo them. Uh, you're, you're not getting it. You have to take a further step. What's that? You have to have the government come in and not just control or regulate or tax, the government has to seize, take over, own and run the enterprises. Sort of the difference, crudely put, between the Soviet Union and Western European Scandinavian type socialisms. Okay, that's another way of understanding what socialism is. And I know they fight with each other, these two, and I know each one demonizes the other often and it claims the other one isn't genuine social. I get it. I get it. Then there's a third one. And the third one says, we're not interested in either of you. We don't like either of you. Why? Because the first one and the second one have something in common that strikes us as intolerable. You don't question either of the first two, the employer-employee relationship. The first one leaves it in place private capitalism with some government regulation. The second one thinks it's making a momentous move by replacing the private employer with state officials as employers. But that leaves the relationship the same. And we, we, this third group, and you can see obviously where I put myself, for this third group, the first two haven't taken the step that should have been taken from the beginning. That you have to, whatever you do with government, with ownership, with state and private, whatever you do, you have to also include the transformation of the workplace in the specific socialist sense. Namely, that no more dichotomy between a small group of people who own and make all the key business decisions that the vast majority of employees simply have to accept with no accountability. You have to get rid of that. You have to substitute the democratic collective ownership operation and running of the enterprise by all the people in it. One person, one vote. That so. They call themselves socialists. They even celebrate the regulation of the first kind, even some government takeover of the second kind. But for them, that's a secondary question. It isn't important. I'm exaggerating, but I want to drive the point home. It isn't important what portion the government does or the private sector does. That's really... The question is, if they're both using the employer-employee model of organizing production, they're both standing squarely against what Marx argued for and devoted his life to understanding as the negative to be overcome of capitalism. And so I would argue these are three different definitions of socialism. They have lots in common. They have lots of differences. And they're fighting it out. And my guess is, if you want my prediction, which is all it's worth, which is not much as a prediction, then the 19th and the 20th century were the struggle between these first two. Mm -hmm. And the 21st century will be the ascendance of this third one and the decline and disappearance of the first two. And that shouldn't shock <laughs> or surprise okay. anyone. 
because if there's anything the Marxist socialist tradition believes in, it's the, continu the continuity of change. Nothing stays the same. It's Hegel's old idea. You can't step in the same river twice because neither the river nor you are the same the second time as they were the first time. It's happening, guys. Socialism Soon. is changing. It would be bizarre if it wasn't. And we're watching, we're participating, we're caught up in these changes, which, by the way, we should welcome. Things have been learned that make those first two decline. But, you know, not, when you're part of a tradition that's declining, it's very hard. And I, I don't mean this to be cute. You know, when a, when a, when a tradition of any kind is on the upswing, growing, it's kind of a good ride. It's a heady ride. You feel, you feel your oats. You feel your growth. You feel your power. It's a very different experience when that particular tradition it's, peaks guys, and it's, it's peaked. going down. Capitalism is peaked. It's I leaving soon, guys. The audience of this conversation here in America should be acutely aware of what I'm saying because that's it's almost the case gone. of American capitalism. We had a fantastic ride from independence to around 1970. That's over and it ain't coming back. The dynamic core of capitalism is gone. It has abandoned the United States just as 50 years earlier it abandoned um, the Midwest for the West and the Southwest. And 50 years before that, it abandoned New England to go to the Midwest. Capitalism is a dynamic system. Nobody insisted on that more than Marx. And it is moved. And the United States is in a situation of decline. The only real example for us is Britain, who declined starting about a century ago and is still denying it as best it can, although the denial has now reached the ridiculous proportion. Uh, Brexit is the last chapter of a sad book. And we ought to learn about it, but it's very hard. And, and I appreciate the difficulty of it. So we have one deluded leader after another who's quite sure that his policies are going to turn around this process. And that that's somewhere between tragic and sad and pathetic. In in your prediction, where you think that it would be moving more towards this, um, what you're defining as socialism, basically like more worker cooperatives, stuff like that, I, uh, what is going to be put in place to achieve something like that? Because I feel that outside of, you know, people who actually are interested in this stuff, this is not a widely known concept. Like, you know, on the internet, we call right. them normies. Like the every the everyday American isn't thinking about worker cooperatives. He's thinking about putting food on the table. And he's not thinking the solution to his life is to form a worker co-op with his friends or something like that. Um, and typically it, what happens when there is mass alienation is it seems that people look to scapegoat. They look towards strong men who are going to tell them, hey, it's not... It's it's not uh, a system itself oppressing you. It's, uh, you know, it's Muslims or it's uh, immigrants or stuff like that. So so how do we not go down that trajectory and, and go down this this one, this path that you're saying would be uh, a way to ameliorate everyone's lives? I, the two parts to my answer to that. It's a great question. Two parts of my answer. One, again, the history, because that's who I am. And I don't know any other way to, to reason this. Make sure to remind um, everyone that Destiny gets mad when you bring history in up. In 1789 in Paris and the rest of France, there's a revolution going on. The mass of people are exactly as you just described Americans today. They want to know where's the bread going to be on the table? Uh, how am I going to feed my family? How am I going to keep a roof over my head? Uh, they could give a crap about feudalism versus capitalism. They, the, me the words had no meaning. The, the urgency was gone. And yet, in their anger and their rage, when they yanked the aristocrats sitting at the top of feudalism in a cart to a big piazza and, and guillotined them and separated their head from the rest of their body, they, they were articulating the demand for a change they could not define. And yet some people said, OK, let's go in this direction. The, the people who, who guillotined, the, they didn't know they wanted to substitute employer-employee relationship for lord-surf relationship. 
That's a retrospective assessment of what came out of the chaos of that time. But let's be honest, there were those who understood this in the terms we now use, who gave some direction to the mobs, to the angry people, to the desperados, and all the rest that a revolution creates. And that's why we had the outcome of a transition to capitalism rather than, and by the way, there were scapegoat efforts of all kinds in the French Revolution that took the place, uh, took other directions that people fought over. Okay, I think the same thing applies now. What is moving the American people, and you could see it in the last four or five years when suddenly the polls in this country indicate that socialism looks good to a sizable number of our Young people. people. And poll after poll, Gallup and the others are showing that. Bernie Sanders does as well as he does. AOC does as well as she does, and so on. Uh, and, and it's clear to me, having been a teacher all my life in the United States, that people are not voting for socialism, they're voting against capitalism or whatever it is they take to be. And their theoretical understanding, given the last 75 years of Cold War uh, craziness in this country, is, and I'll be polite now, minimal. Okay, but the question is, as the system declines, as I think it is, and as the people at the top offload the costs of decline onto the middle class and the poor, more Sargon and of more. Stealing That's why we just went up? through Sus a viral stream. pandemic Whoa. in which more than half the labor the labor force of America was unemployed. Hold on one sec. And you talk about How many uh, experiences miss, with it. You know, the Mondragon Corporation, which I often refer to <laughs> simply because it's the biggest of these co-ops, you know, they have their own university, the Mondragon University. It's been going for many, many years. It has an elaborate curriculum. How do you start a co-op? How do you finance a co-op? How do you deal with the internal problems when you have a democratically run enterprise? Those are all kinds of complicated questions. How do you have authority? Who's a supervisor? How do you handle? So it's, we're not starting from zero here. Mm -hmm. In the United States, we may be, but in many other parts of the world, they can and want to help us if we're only willing to begin the process of moving. And, you know, Americans like things practical. That's a bit of a shtick in this society. Well, here's your abstract socialism, Marxism, anarchism, and a whole lot of other isms concretely realizable in a way that is pretty close to what many of those traditions have moved toward. So let's try. Maybe we'll get the American people on the practical end of this and they will work their way back to the theoretical rather than expecting them to start with the theoretical and find their way to the practical. It's our job to offer them all the different ways of going. Um. I've almost had you here for two hours, so uh, I, I, I'm assuming I'm, I'm running close to my time. I was going to ask, uh, is it okay if I, I ask the, an audience question or two? Or, or please, please, yeah? please. Um, and while I, while I wait for the audience to, to uh, catch up with uh, that request, because they're only about a, a minute behind, uh, the one final question I want to ask you about that, when it comes to implementing... Uh, things like worker cooperatives on a large scale. What are some like tangible things that people can do here in North America to try and advocate for them uh, that you think would be the most effective and actually changing policy? Well, uh, there are two things. One, there already is a pretty well developed organization of worker co-ops here in the United States. It's called the United States Federation of Worker Co-ops. And it has its own way. Okay, this is more, hold on. Um, the organizers of the event uh, decided it would be better if we did not attend, and we uh, were happy to to um, uh, to abide by their wishes. Relating to what you tweeted about Israel, <laughs> I believe so. You know, I'm not sure, but I believe. So. Um. 
worker co-ops are varying. You know, some of them give everybody the same salary. Others of them give people very different. I mean, all the different versions or variations, Maybe. you can get a sense of the richness of the already achieved experience uh, that can inform your own thinking or your own plan. So that's one way to go. Uh, it's a little harder to tell you where to go uh, for the advocacy part of this. Uh, and it, but it's only hard because uh, I don't want to appear immodest. But the organization that I'm part of, Democracy at Work, notice the title, the Democracy at Work, that's what we do. We advocate for all of this in every way that we know how. And we have a website, democracyatwork.info, known as The Shakers, famous for their beautiful furniture that they produce. They still exist, by the way, in Pittsfield, Massachusetts, and no, some other I didn't places. Mean uh, the Shakers were a worker co-op. They organized the production of the furniture and other things they made as worker cooperatives. So they're very old. They exist around the world, including in the United States. But in the aftermath of World War II, in the I Cold don't know if War I have period, water here now. they got frightened because what they are is an alternative to capitalism, which was not a cool thing to be uh, after 1945. So they became very concerned to rebrand themselves, to do away with any hint or suggestion that they were against capitalism. Oh, no, 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 no. We are just a warm and cuddly alternative entrepreneurial arrangement. Okay, I understand it. I sympathize with it. If they had not done that, they might have been purged with the purge of communist socialists that was the McCarthy period and all of that. So they survived, but by becoming very much un- concerned with being a critical movement against capitalism. What democracy at work dot info, what we do is reestablish that this is not just an interesting, unusual, warm and cuddly way of organizing a business. This is the vanguard of an anti-capitalist social transformation. And I can tell you because you'll enjoy it. When I give speeches to people who are in worker co-ops, the first 20 minutes of my talk, they love it. Because what I'm doing is saying, hey, you're not just making an interesting business here. You are part of a social transformation. You're heroes and heroines. They love it. But in the second 20 minutes, it dawns on them that they're now going to be in danger of being viewed as an anti-capitalist, and then the police or the, the FBI or somebody <laughs> is going to get interested in what? them, and they do not want. Okay, because I'm genuinely ignorant. In the past, like thirty years, what antagonism has existed between like the police and the FBI and social? Has this been like a? Th Did I miss this? Or like, is there like some? I know that like for certain black groups during the civil rights era, although I think. Personally, it probably had less to do with them being socialist and more to do with them being black um, and, and, and oriented towards civil rights. Like, has this, like... Oh, fuck. I accidentally paused it. So the whole thing is fucked. One of, in my mind, one of the greatest Marxist theorists of the last century was the Italian Antonio Gramsci. And... For those who are not familiar, he was the head of the Italian Communist Party. He built that party from a very small beginning in 1920-21 to the point where it was the most powerful communist party in all of Europe in terms of its membership and in terms of its social influence uh, on, the Italian, uh, on Italian history. He was arrested by Mussolini, put in jail, and effectively killed in jail. Uh, but while he was in jail, he started a program of reading and keeping notebooks about what he was reading. And those have been published in many languages, including English, as the prison notebooks uh, of Antonio Gramsci. But they are 
really brilliant pieces of analysis of, for example, the role of the family in Italian politics and history, the role of the Vatican, the role of regional differences, because you know the north of Italy relative to the south have at least as many tensions as say the north and south of the United States. So on a whole range of issues, this communist leader, Marxist thinker, had the enforced leisure of jail to read and to think and to share with the rest of us what he sense he was making Wait, as somebody who wanted to take Italy beyond capitalism. Uh, he died. They let him out of jail the last month, but he basically died in Mussolini's um, jail. So the, it's a multiple volume work. Prison Notebooks, published by the Columbia University Press in New York, uh, a remarkable uh, compendium of really brilliant Marxist um, uh, analysis. Another book I'm reading is a brand new book, may surprise you, by Mark oh, Bittman, B-I-T-T-M-A-N. He was for many, many years the food and restaurant critic of the New York Times. Uh, he's retired from that job, and he's written a book called Animal, Vegetable, Junk. And what he is doing there is explaining how the profit-driven capitalist system of producing and distributing and packaging food has been the disaster he argues it has been. This is a man who spent his entire life studying the food business, broadly understood. And this is what he gleans from it. It is a powerful criticism of capitalism in general, capitalism in the United States, in the whole question of how it shapes food and thereby us, since we are all, whatever else we are, food-eating animals. Um, Can I not catch that one, sky thing here? Well, there's it said two. surface. I find going back to philosophy a wonderful um, experience in rethinking things in a productive way. So I hope folks won't laugh, but there are two philosophers I've been reading, rereading recently. Don't One say Hegel. is uh, Marx's teacher, Hegel. God damn it. Um, his, his critique of law. Logic is an extraordinary piece of work about how we think about the world. Makes you much more conscious. It's a little bit like going to therapy, where you learn about your own psychological mechanisms uh, and wonder why you hadn't learned it earlier. And the other one Don't is a Kant. student of Marx and Hegel, oh, okay. uh, who I've returned to several times in my life, the uh, French philosopher Louis Althusser. Uh, A-L-T-H-U-S-S-E-R. Um, because he was French, he could do something that no American philosophical professor could do. Uh, he was the leading philosopher in uh, France, a contemporary of Jean-Paul Sartre. Uh, he was, all of his adult life, uh, a member of the French Communist Party, but also a professor uh, at the most prestigious university in France, something called the École Normale Supérieure in Paris, where he became the rector, that's like the highest official of the university. It's like the president of the university. Only in France and in other European countries could a member who was proudly and publicly uh, a Communist Party person also hold the most prestigious chair in philosophy that the country had. He wrote brilliantly about Marxism, brilliantly critical of the Soviet Union, philosophically as well as politically, uh, a wonderful example of what creative Marxism could do uh, within the framework of the Communist Party, but at the same time, very critical both of the French Communist Party and of the Soviet Union, and, and reading this kind of work by a professional philosopher, which he was all his life, um, 
I find these things to be very, very exciting for me. I uh, I won't lie. I have a lot of trouble reading Hegel. Like it's it's one of those things that people are always yeah. like you you have to do it to understand where Marx came from. But at the same time, I'm always like, whoa, this is dry. This is old yeah. and dry. <laughs> well, you know, it's a little bit. It's a little. You're right. It is. It's a different idiom. You know, it's, it's, it's a different language and all the rest. But it, pay, it it repays the effort. You stay with it. Then after a while, you begin to get the kind of the the rhythm of it. And then you'll see it becomes caught in the sunken sea. Here, here's something for him there. If you go and get uh, the Phenomenology of Mind, one of his best known books, there's a preface or an introduction, an early part. And in that is a, an eight or nine page section called The Dialectic of the Master and the Slave. In 11 or 12 pages, you will get an analysis of slavery that you will never forget that will give you insights into the racial problems of the United States right now, you can get no other way. And it's just eight or 10 pages. And yeah, don't let the language throw you. It's a little arcane, it's a little dry, but work at those eight or nine pages and you will be <laughs> glad you did. Uh, one of the questions being asked is what happens in worker cooperatives when people vote against their own interests and perhaps the own interests of the environment, for example, like if coal miners vote to keep mining for coal? Well, you know, that would never once happen. you start thinking about worker co-ops, you will discover right away uh, the kind of problems which, again, historically, capitalists discovered. Capitalists, when they set up an enterprise and hired workers and made a product and sold it, thought they were done if they did that profitably. Oh, okay, never mind. But then they were bluntly shown, uh-uh, there's a community. You know, these workers, you have, they live over there in that village or in that town. And the smokestack that you have in your factory, it's dumping smoke onto them. And their children are all getting asthma. You, you can't produce the way you want to profit the way you want because you have to enter into some co-respectivity with the communities you impact. And so then laws got passed and you had to get a license to have a smokestack. Why? Because of the, and you begin to have to develop institutions to take account of an irreducible fact that the community makes decisions that impact the business and vice versa. And since you impact each other, there has to be some negotiation for how this works. Otherwise, well, each of you will undo the life of the other. So exactly the same has to happen with worker co-ops. They have to understand that they're in a mutual, co-respective relationship with communities of residential nature. In a sense, the workplace is a community at work and the, the home is a community residential or a community at play or a community at recreation or sleeping or whatever you do in your home. And there's going to have to be co-respectivity, which means if you're a, a, a coal mining co-op, what about the coal, the, the smoke, and the, 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 the soot, and all the particle matter that you are dumping in this community? You have to, there has to be veto power. The community has to have power over the workplace and vice versa. You have to work this out. And that's going to happen here. And ironically, the democracy in the, work, in the residential, where we at least have voting for whoever makes the rules as mayor or council person or, or senator or president. None of that exists in, the cap, in a capitalist workplace. The workers don't vote for anybody. Uh, by democratizing the workplace, you reinforce the democracy of the residential place and they now have to work out their relationship. And that relationship gives real power of each location on to the other. And by the way, we have examples of modern societies that tried to do that. In the aftermath of World War I, uh, Germany, the, the Constitution of Germany written after World War I, and remember before that, they had an empire. The leader of Germany before that was the Kaiser. That's the German equivalent of czar or the German equivalent of emperor. They got rid of the empire, they got rid of the emperor, 
and they set Sorry. up a parliamentary democracy. But you may be surprised. They set it up with two houses. Everybody got a vote as a citizen where you lived and in a, and you elected people to a, to a house of parliament. But you also set up this very interesting in the Weimar period because the constitution was written in the German city of Weimar. The second house of parliament you elected from where you worked. It was a workers elected body and the two bodies had to agree. Imagine if we had a Senate that was elected according to where we live, but a House of Representatives that was elected according to where we work. And we each had two votes, one for where we live and one for where we work. And all laws had to be acceptable to us as workers and to us as residents. A wholly different history would emerge from a society that did that. That's what worker co-ops would do, but they would learn. That fair when people in New Jersey and shit start dictating New York <laughs> laws. Interesting. <laughs> um, I guess one of the last I don't know what, like, uh, what, that has popped up a couple of times What is the most common now, exurb or whatever where you'd live um, in and work in for New York? There would be mass scale worker cooperatives. In, people in, in Virginia start writing North laws America. for D.C. A, do you have any idea on what you would ever predict as a timeline for that? And then B... What would be the transformation necessary on, say... I'm making fun of him, but technically, it's it's actually kind of an interesting assertion, right? Like, if you have some, like, area that you work in constantly, like, should you have a say in terms of, like, how that area is ran? You spend a lot of your life there, a lot of your life working there. It's not actually the worst idea in the world. I just hate this guy. Oh, that make the, make the community and the workplace co-respective, mm -hmm. sharers in decision-making, veto power on one another, et cetera, et cetera. But I do think this is scalable. I think the Mondragon Corporation Mondragon. is a demonstration of God, the scalability. The, you know, capitalist enterprises, here comes the history again, had to learn how to go from the small enterprise with an owner who starts the business and a dozen workers or something like that to the modern mega corporation, which has hundreds Moot. of thousands. There was a whole long, difficult translation uh, transition uh, where you had to learn what a stock market was, how you could issue shares, how you could come become bigger than one family could ever manage, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I expect the same with worker co-ops. They will have difficulties scaling. And we can see some of that already with the Mondragon Corporation. It started in 1956 with a, a Catholic priest and six workers. It is now the seventh largest corporation in Spain and has over 100,000 workers. It's a study in spectacular growth over a period of 70 years. But during that time, it's had all kinds of problems it had to solve in, in going from a very small business to a very, very large business. And I would expect the lessons of that, of those difficulties would be applied, learned, and and struggled with uh, here as well. I think the role of the government is a very, very important Oh, issue. this is it, right? And, and, and it would be a good way for me to end this conversation because it points in a direction. What we have is two political parties, Republican and Democrat, who both agree that capitalism is wonderful. They both endorse it, they support it, they are enthusiastic celebrants. Uh, you, I, I think many of you saw that famous a uh, moment when a college, uh, young college kid asks a question of Nancy Pelosi. I think that was during the 2016 race. And he a asks her in some college where she's speaking, uh, what do you say to Bernie Sanders and the interest of, of people my age in socialism? Uh, and she looked so befuddled. You see the camera focus in on Nancy Pelosi's face. She really doesn't know what to say. So she kind of ends up saying to him, and these are words that I quote, we're all capitalists now. Exactly. We have two people. That Fuck, it's the FBI, the CIA. By American capitalists. He was right. For help. Lower taxes, subsidies, roads built so they can get goods in and goods out quickly. Subsidies for every conceivable need. They have harbors, rivers educating their workers at public expense. We've had two parties that have gone out of their way to develop capitalist enterprises. What we need 
and what, between you and me and the lamppost, what I think is coming is a political party with a different agenda. Surf clam. That was the its fish, right, that I needed? It will be to get a government that will give comparable subsidies, tax breaks, and supports to cooperative business, to level oh, the playing that. field so that government no longer thinks of itself as having the one objective of supporting one kind of corporate production structure. And let there then be a synergy between a political party that's the advocate for worker co-ops and the worker co-ops that become the political base, the voter base, and the funding base Are you okay, Lance? for such a political party. And again, a historical reminder, that's where the capitalist political parties came from. They emerged out of feudalism. They had the financial and voter support of the capitalist urban centers in Europe against the old feudal aristocracy. So let's learn from that and let's develop new political party or parties that is the advocate for the Marcora law like Italy has to come here, for the program of government support for worker co-ops that we can borrow from Jeremy Corbyn and uh, John McDonnell. And let's have the worker co-ops see the importance of voting for and funding a political party that enhances their ability to become a contesting sector of U.S. economics. I totally agree with you that something has to be put forward there. I just I know this is opening up a can of worms right when you're like, I'm about to leave. But I think that there's only two viable political like a two party system in the US. So I don't see a third party being politically viable. My idea would be to infect the Democratic Party with more people uh, who are more aligned with, uh, you know, our personal beliefs, like your your Bernie Sanders style um, to get them to pass significant legislation rather than forming a completely third party or something like that. I'm, I'm a bit more agnostic. Here's what I want. I want people inside the Democratic Party to try to do exactly what you said. And at the same time, people who don't want to work inside the Democratic Party do the same program outside. And let's see how it works in both ways. Maybe they can work together. Maybe they can merge at some point. Maybe each will discover oh, things that one can do that the other can't. But let's go in that direction. Uh, and let us learn as we go what the best particular organizational way of doing it might be. Thanks so much for your time, Richard. Is there anything you want to uh, plug or, or talk about? No, I just would remind people, if you're interested in, a, in this way of thinking, uh, the best way to find out about what we do is go to our website, democracyatwork.info. Uh, and also, if you're not aware of it, I do a weekly radio and television show called Economic Update uh, that's available pretty much everywhere in the United States, either on the radio or, or both. Thank you so much, Richard. It was, a, it was a pleasure as always. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, okay. believe it or not, I'm off to another interview. <laughs> <laughs> Have fun. <laughs> All right, Len. <laughs> Remember to hit that like and subscribe, and don't forget the notification bell so that my videos show up right in your feed. I was joking around in the comments. Some people were, were mixing it up. I said something like, uh, would someone be able to give us a list of 10 to 12 examples of things that are not feudalist, just to like really set the context?